Where do you live? Where do you live? I'm not a stranger. Who do you live with? Papa? Does that feel like home? Yes. I have a question. When you go on vacation or when you go spend the night at a friend's house and then you come back, what's that feeling like? Yeah, he's home. Feel good, right? About homecoming? <sighs> That's what we're doing today. We have homecoming. We have a lot of people here who have come home to this church for a little bit. Yeah, we did too. I'm waiting. Now you do. And see, that's part of homecoming. A lot of times when you come home, you get to eat and drink and you spend time with friends and family and just a good place to relax, right? Well, God has a few words about homecoming, okay? Um, it says here, it's Mark five nineteen. Jesus suffered him not, but said to him, go home to thy friends. Tell them how great things the Lord hath done for you and hath had compassion for you. So when we go home, we tell people about Jesus. We go everywhere we tell people about Jesus, right? And then we're still talking about home. Um, we have homes here. We have houses and apartments and trailers and tents and whatever, right? Um, but even if those things disappear, God has a place for us. He said, John 4, 2, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So even if we don't feel like we have home here, God has a place for us in heaven, okay? And I want y'all to remember that. All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to have this home church, a place where we feel comfortable and we feel loved. And Lord, we know that wherever we go and whatever we do, you're always with us and we always have someone to love us no matter what happens. And God, thank you for building mansions for us in heaven and preparing a place for us when this world is not anymore. And so... We ask that you be with this church, that you be with these people, that you bless them, watch over them, and open their hearts to receive your word. And Lord, thank you for home. Amen. Okay, we made a couple quick changes here. Let, we're going to do page 391 for first this
homecoming Sunday here at Victory. We're so glad that you're here. We're glad for all of our visitors and home folks alike. It's just a joy to be together in the house of God. If you don't have Jesus, you are poverty stricken. And if you have Jesus, you're rich beyond your wildest dreams. Amen. Amen. Jesus. I've been to the cemetery too many times lately, but I've noticed every time I've been that the spot was the same size. Didn't matter if they lived in a mansion and had millions or if they lived in a shack and had nothing. It's all the same. So Jesus is the reason we're here. Oh, I know there's food afterwards you're thinking about. And there's been plenty of it fixed, and it'll be great to fellowship around the table. But uh, we're here to worship Jesus and to recognize his presence. Glad to have my brother and his wife Brenda with us today. Ben is, uh, goes all over the country preaching everywhere he goes. Uh, he preaches good sermons, I'd give him. And uh, I'm, glad that, <laughs> I'm glad that he's here today. Ben, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Amen, amen. And uh, that old fellow sitting back there in the sound room with all that gray hair, <laughs> thinning hair. Brother Lee Cook's birthday is this week, and Ben Eli's is this week. Let's sing a happy birthday. Sharon McCullough have an anniversary coming up this week, so we wish them a happy anniversary. As far as announcements in the bulletin, you see a note about Vacation Bible School that'll be here in three weeks, and so if you can help or you want more information, see Wendy Hughes, and she'll be glad to, to hook you up with what's going on in our Vacation Bible School. All right, Cheryl's going to come and sing for us. The name of this song is Homesick for Heaven. And when you get to thinking about going, don't you sometimes just say, let's go, we're ready to go, let's go. <clears throat> I know we have to wait on the Lord to call us home, but.
Tessa is at the hospital, and uh, she went early this morning, and uh, Clem is with Denise, of course, because they want her to bring him to the hospital as soon as the baby's born. Can't be in there while that's happening, but to see his little sister before anybody else gets to see her. And uh, he, he, he sat there on the couch this morning looking at me grinning, and he said, Papa, look, had on a shirt that said, I'm the big brother. <laughs> So Denise sent a text a while ago and said the, the, the baby seemed to be in a little distress and they're thinking about going ahead and, and uh, taking it. She's, she's in labor, but it's not coming quite as fast as they want to. So pray everything goes well. This will be number 15 for us. So, uh, you know, y'all will have to take a special offering so we can have Christmas. <laughs> Amen. Carrie, it is so good to see you and Richard this morning and your family with us. W would you come and play something? And, uh, Carrie's no stranger to our, our folks. And uh, uh, Catherine, you want to say anything nice about her? <laughs> She's what? She's a sweetie. Yes, okay. God bless you, Carrie. Hey, Lee, turn, turn number four up.
Brother Cat, can we do number 14 one more time? All right. This is a song that is one of our favorites, Mama Cat's favorites. We sing it. You going to sing and let us help you? Turn to number 14, stand, and let's sing together. <laughs> Put your heart into it. <laughs> Moves my heart. When folks like Miss Kathy, knowing the struggle that she's going through right now, her heart is pure. Heart is pure. While churches are dying and folks are playing with their souls, there's still a crowd that loves Jesus. He's real, ain't he, Mama? One of these days we're going to see him face to face. Scoffers can scoff and laugh and poke fun, but he's real, and I feel him in my soul. Brian Edinger is not a stranger to this congregation. He's a homeboy. I didn't call you a homie. I said you're a homie. <laughs> he... Uh, he went to New York with his family a couple of years ago now. 
established a church there, worked hard. We, we supported him, and I told you then that I hadn't met a young man that I had believed in any more than I believe in Brian Edinger. I believe he's God's man. I believe he was called of God, and he has been used of God and is used of God. And uh, he had never been a pastor of this church, but that's okay. Uh, he's here today to bring the homecoming message. And if you'll open your heart, and if you'll listen with your heart, you will hear something worth hearing. Brother Brian, you come. I never know how to follow up something like that. Uh, <laughs> so I think I'm just going to open in prayer. Let's start with that. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the amazing things that have already gone on this morning. To already feel you here, Lord, that we get a chance to be in your presence. And I just ask this morning as I try to bring your word that I don't get in the way at all. That this be about you and what you have for us today. The message that you have prepared for us through me, Lord. I just ask that... Um, it changes when we hear your word, when we hear the gospel, Lord, that we do not come away the same, that we're going to go out from today and praise you and glorify you because of what you have done for us. And I just ask this for each and every one of us today. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to spend our time with a story here that you're probably familiar with. And so again, I'm probably not going to add anything new to it, but maybe I can give you a little bit of insight here. But if you've been in church long enough, there's actually a song about it. Okay, so I'm going to start the song and really hope that other people know this so that you do not hear me sing for very long. So please join in if you know this song. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Thank you. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. That was my favorite part. I got to yell in church, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. And from what I remember of this, that's what I remember. I was like, oh, that's a neat little story. All right, we got Jesus come along, and then he goes to eat with somebody who was really short. I was like, oh, that's it. And what I ended up missing was actually the very last verse of this, which actually is the meaning of everything about Zacchaeus. And what is the meaning of what we're going to do today? So today I want us to take a look at this story, a very familiar story, but hopefully I can give you a little bit of insight on it. This comes from Luke chapter 19. Only one of the gospel writers who mentioned this story, Luke chapter 19. And it's verses 1 through 10, so if you want to open your Bible there or turn on your Bible, that's kind of where we're at today too. If you have my version of the Bible, it's page 1,694 if that helps. Luke 19, 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. Verse 7, when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He is going to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Now, we're going to focus on the story, but I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to do this a little bit different. I'm going to give you the ending first. I'm going to tell you everything that this is about and what my whole entire sermon is about. It is verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. We know that when it references the Son of Man, we're talking about Jesus Christ. 
And so I like wording it this way. For Jesus Christ has come to seek and save those which was lost. He has come to seek and save those that need to be called home. So before we talk about too much of what Jesus did, let me tell you what Jesus Christ did not come into this world for. He did not come here to be just a good teacher. He didn't come here to be a moral leader, to give people ideas on how to raise their spiritual consciousness. He didn't come to just provide a human example of a noble religious life. But he did come to rescue doomed sinners. Because our God is a saving God. Everything in the New Testament points to that truth. And everything here explains that truth to us. It was even made clear before his birth. In Matthew 1.21, it says, She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus Christ came to seek and save the lost. So our first question has to be is, why does he even need to seek the lost? Shouldn't they be seeking after him? You know, it always reminds me, and again, this is not really a spoiler alert. If you haven't seen Forrest Gump by this point in time, you're probably not going to ever watch it. One of my favorite lines in there is when Lieutenant Dan is talking to Forrest and says, Forrest, have you found Jesus? Y'all remember his response? Well, I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him, Lieutenant Dan. That's my best Forrest Gump I got. I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him. So who seeks after Jesus? What about these people who are going to try to seek God? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 3.11, there's no one who understands. There's none who seeks for God. No one is seeking after him. If they are, it's only because God has put it that desire to their heart. I mean, think about it. No one's going to seek after God. Why would we? We're sinners. Thanks for having me for homecoming. We're all sinners. Every single one of us. Deep down, even if you don't think you are, I can promise you, you have done wrong. Why would you seek after a holy God? Someone who essentially you've just said, I don't care about your word. I'm going to do my own thing anyway. Nobody's going to seek after him. For some of you, you might be like Forrest. Why do I need to seek him anyway? I didn't know I was supposed to even be finding him. Why would I need saving? Because we've all sinned. And if he didn't seek after us, we have no hope of doing this on our own. You can't save yourself. And we still have people today that think they can. There are a lot of people out there today that believe they can save themselves. If I just live a good life, if I just follow the rules, if I just show up whenever the doors are open to church, then God is going to have to let me in. He owes that to me. But that's not how this is going to work. The only thing the world owes you is death. You've done wrong, you've sinned, and the wages of sin. Wages mean what you are owed is death. So... If you are a believer here today and God has saved you to be with him forever, you have no one else to thank but him. We only saw him because he first sought us. We only love him because he first loved us. You owe your entire present life and eternal life to him. You owe him everything. Thank him and praise him each and every day. And if you're a non-believer here today, first off, welcome. But secondly, it's not an accident that you're here today. God is seeking after you too. You may have been like Forrest. I didn't know I was even supposed to be looking for him. He's seeking after you. And the good news is, is he's seeking to save you. And we can see how he does that in this story today. Our story today about Zacchaeus is one of the clearest biblical examples of God seeking a specific sinner. That man in the midst of a massive crowd had a divine appointment with the seeking, saving Lord. Jesus located him, called him by name, and pursued him to salvation. This, tour, this story tells us how we can get salvation. All right, so here it is. Here's my three points. Everybody ready? Here's how you can get salvation. First, you've got to climb a tree. <laughs> Second, you've got to get over a crowd. And third, you've got to take Jesus home. It's good enough, right? Here we go. All right, no. Let me go a little bit further and explain that. Because this first part, climbing up a tree is probably the hardest part. Verses 1 through 4, it says, He entered Jericho, was passing through. There was a man by the name of Zacchaeus, chief tax collector. He was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him. Who's climbing the tree here? Zacchaeus is. Why? Well, got to make sure we remember what Zacchaeus was. He was a tax collector. Tax collectors were the most hated and despised outcasts in Israel. My life's changed. No, I'm kidding. All right. This is one of the most hated, despised outcasts. They were Jews who were working for Rome. They collected taxes for Rome. 
which is perfectly fine. That's okay. But what they did is they actually charged more than they were required to. Collect a little bit extra for themselves. They wanted to collect even more, charge their own people even more. The citizens had to pay these people. And then if they didn't pay them, they would have the Roman guards come after them. And then the Roman guards didn't care. They got a cut of whatever it was anyway. So the more you charge, the better it was. And they're doing this to their own people. So most tax collectors would take up money for the hated enemy of the Jews and then charge their own people extra and got rich off of it. And the Jews saw this as the ultimate betrayal. Now, this wasn't a small extra charge. I, I listed some of the things that they did here. They did a poll tax. You got charged 1% for being alive. You had a land tax, an income tax. Wow, this sounds familiar. Taxes on the transport of goods, letters, produce that you had to use the road to cross a bridge, and almost anything else the tax collectors could even think of. They did this with extortion. They had loan sharks. Tax collectors employed thugs in the Roman guard to beat up and intimidate people. They were completely and totally despised. Now, before we get too far, pay your taxes. This sermon is not about not paying your taxes. Pay Caesar what is Caesar's. But what God is against was abusive or illegitimate taxes. Extortion, dishonesty, taking money from people by use of physical violence, intimidation, and cruelty. So pay your taxes, but don't gain your money dishonestly. And here's the crazy part. Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector. He was the chief one. He was very rich. The other tax collectors are making money off of the other people, and he's getting a cut of what they're making it off of. So he even wants them to charge more so he can make more. And I want you to see today, this chief tax collector is going to find salvation. That's what this story is about. So if you feel like Jesus could never save me, not with the things I've done, not with what was in my past. I want you to know, if Zacchaeus can be saved, there's hope for you. I mean, every time I heard the story of Zacchaeus when I was a kid, I always wondered, you know, if he was so short, why didn't people just move out of the way and let him sit up there? And then I went to Disney World, and I know why. You remember the parades for Disney World, if you've ever been there before? If you haven't been a part of that spectacular thing that happens there when everybody starts lining up for an hour early before the parade to get a spot right there in the front, because if you're in the back, you can't see any of the parade. And it is brutal out there on the happiest place on earth. I mean, those people are mean. They get there, they're not letting you in. They have it out. They put their buggies and their carts everywhere. They got all their strollers lined out. Like, you're not getting anywhere close to the front. Every now and then, you'd have somebody who was really nice that would let one of your children go up front if they sat and stayed quiet. You had no hope. You weren't getting to the front of the line. You had to stay all the way in the back. And so we were always trying to get there as soon as we can and stake out our own little spot. And I'm going to tell you, nobody's going to make room for Zacchaeus. He may have been rich, but because of what he was doing, he was barred from the synagogue. He was considered unclean. He was cut off from most, all social relationships. The only friends he had were other tax collectors. It's no wonder they wouldn't let him move up at the front. You can almost see it now. This is their way to get revenge. Ha, little man, you get the back. You don't even get to come up to the front. Like this is their one moment to get their revenge back on him. Now, I did just make a big deal about no one seeking after God. And after this, you might say, isn't Zacchaeus trying to seek God? He's going for him, right? He's looking for him. But read very carefully what's actually happening here. Pay close attention. What does it say Zacchaeus is doing? Verse 3, if you look at it, it says Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was. He's not seeking after him. When I watch a parade, I'm not trying to seek after the people that are in the parade. I'm just trying to watch. He's curious. He has an intellectual curiosity about who Jesus Christ is, and that's probably how most non-Christians feel today. Huh. Interesting, but that's about it. He's not trying to meet Jesus, I don't believe. I mean, if you were going to try to meet somebody, would you just try to climb a tree? I'm not going to try to meet him that way. I'd want to get up there to the front. He probably could have forced his way to the front. He had thugs working for him. Hey, get out of my way or I'm going to charge you more taxes. But he didn't try that hard. He just wanted to climb a tree to see who he was. So this is somebody who just has an intellectual curiosity who's not really seeking him. And I want to give you your ironic twist today. Does anybody know what Zacchaeus means in Hebrew? Probably not unless you studied for this lesson this week. 
Does anybody know what it means? His name means clean, innocent, pure, righteous. Yeah, up until this point in his life, he hasn't even lived up to a single bit of that. But this encounter with Jesus will give him the hope to live up to his name. Just as Jesus gives us hope to live up to his name. Are you embarrassed of some of the things you've done in the past? You're not living up, your na- up to your name, your family name? There's hope. So Zacchaeus climbs a tree in order to see Jesus. And that's actually our first steps that we need to do to the same thing. So how is that? I figure I'll probably need to explain how you need to climb a tree. Climbing a tree in those days would have been an embarrassing thing to do. This is a culture that prided themselves on their dignity. If you remember the story of the prodigal son, one of the most scandalous things about it is when the son comes home is that the dad just takes off and runs after him. Nobody did that. If you were a dignified adult, you wouldn't just take off and run. You wouldn't go and climb a tree. That's something that kids do. Not only that, but what are everybody going to look at? They're going to see him up in a tree, and they're going to think less of him. He's going to have to lose some of his dignity. When Zacchaeus climbed up the tree, he left his dignity behind. He actually paid an enormous price to climb the tree. That was something a child could do, but not something a dignified adult's going to do. He lost his dignity in order to see Jesus. And look, it's still the same way today. It takes different forms. You don't literally have to go climb a tree, so please let's not make that the after-meal activity. Okay, we don't have to go actually go climb a tree, but you cannot have Jesus' salvation flowing through you unless you're willing to look silly according to the world's rules today. Because people are going to look at you as a Christian and as a believer and think, what a child. They're not enlightened. They're not intelligent. They believe some primitive form you're going to have to lose a little bit of your... You're going to have to swallow your pride and be willing to just not stand on your own dignity or your own pride. And in this case, you even may have to look like a child. Now, what do I mean by that? That may sound like an insult. So give me a minute here. We have a belief in our culture that in order to grow up, you can't believe in the supernatural anymore. I mean, think about it. I was thinking about some of the kids I read when I, you know, some of the books I read when I was a kid. When I was a child, I loved reading like fairy tales, those kind of things. I had all Charlotte's Web, Indian in the Cupboard. If those don't make sense, it's okay. They were all really great books. All these really fairy tale things. And I loved every single one of them. You know why? Because it filled up my heart with wonder. All those great stories. I used to read comic books growing up, especially ALF comic books, if y'all remember ALF. I love video games. I love being a part of those adventures, being the hero that gets to vanquish evil to save the princess. It made my imagination one run wild, and you want to know why? Because fairy tales tell us that there's a world out there that's not just this world. That there's a supernatural world that exists beyond this one, that there's a supernatural force of good, and there's a supernatural force of evil. And we get to be a part of those worlds. A world where people live forever, as we just sang about where everyone wears a crown, and it's so exciting. But what happens? At some point, we have to tell our children, this is what we do every single time, is grow up. Get your head out of the clouds. Put away those childish things. What if I told you guys today that I still play video games? And if those of you that know me, you know that was probably the wildest understatement of the year. You slightly judged me, didn't you, when I said that I I still play video games. Why? Because you think those are kids' things? That I still act like a child? Why would you tell me that? You know, we tell our kids, there's no such thing as supernatural world, supernatural powers, that this world is all there is, that you're just a random combination of organic molecules made in the Big Bang, and it's just survival of the fittest. You pay your taxes and die. Welcome to adulthood. And if you still believe in God, in a devil, in demons, in angels, in heaven, in hell, then you're just a child. You're a primitive intellectual. We tell our children that you have to stop believing in the supernatural if you want to grow up. And if you want to be a Christian, if you want to believe that the Lord of the universe from another world broke into this world, was born in a manger, defeated the powers of evil and death, and rose triumphant over the grave, if you believe that, then you're considered to be an unenlightened adult. You're considered to be a child. You've climbed a tree. You look silly. You look undignified because you don't believe what the world believes. So what are we going to say to that as Christians? 
I mean, what are we going to say to a culture that tells us that if you believe in Christianity that you're still a child? Here's what we can say. Jesus Christ himself said, that's right, you have to be like a child. You're just going to have to get over it. Jesus actually pointed a child out and said, if you want to enter heaven, you have to be like this child. Unless you're as humble as a child, unless you know you need a savior, and a savior, unless you are a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You do have to be willing to get rid of your dignity. You do have to be willing to get rid of your pride. You do have to climb a tree. Most people today are afraid of looking foolish, of looking childish, of being wrong. There's nothing more childish than being afraid of looking childish. Let me say that again because that took a minute for me to sink that one in too. There's nothing more childish than being afraid of looking childish. There are people in this world that are so afraid that they might look childish that they won't even entertain the idea of a world beyond this one. That good and evil actually do exist. That Jesus Christ was God and died for our sins that they actually do need a Savior. Their pride is getting in the way of them having a relationship with Christ. How sad that is. They want to be too grown up. But I will say this for us in the room. When you do grow up, you do need something beyond fairy tales, and it's called the gospel. Because you know what the gospel says? The gospel says that there is a supernatural, there's an evil prince, and we are all under his enchantment, But a hero from another world has broken into this one and redeemed us with sacrificial love. And this sacrificial love redeems us from the curse of the evil one. Just like all the stories say, Harry Potter's mother's sacrificial love makes it possible for him to be redeemed from Voldemort. Aslan's sacrifice for Edmund in the Chronicles of Narnia is the deeper love that the White Witch doesn't know about. Anna's sacrificial love for Elsa is the ultimate example of true love. Black Widow's sacrifice is what allows the evil of Thanos to be defeated. And if you didn't know any of those references, get out in the world a little bit. But... All great stories of sacrificial love are the gospel. That's why we love those stories. The gospel isn't just another wonderful story pointing to these realities. Jesus isn't just one more story. He is the underlying reality to which all of those stories point to. In other words, the gospel is about the supernatural, another world where people live forever, where everyone wears a crown, and it's all true. It's not a fairy tale. It's all true. And if you believe that, it will fill your heart with childlike wonder for the rest of your days. You'll be in awe of what's around you. Your Heavenly Father will be teaching you new things every day. Doesn't that sound wonderful? How many of you today are still a child at heart? You don't have to give up your childlike wonder if you want to believe in the gospel. Yeah, you might have to get up and tree. You may have to look silly according to the wisdom of the world, but you don't have to become jaded to this world. You don't have to harden your heart. You don't have to give up your wonder, and you don't have to be a cynical person. Are you willing to get up into a tree? I mean, if you are, you might be ready for the second part. The second part is, is get over the crowd. And have you ever noticed in this passage before what's the main thing keeping Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus? I always thought it was his short stature. That's actually not what it says in here. It makes it harder for him, for sure. But look at what it says. He says Zacchaeus was trying to see Jesus and unable to because of the crowd. The crowd's what's keeping him from it. And what do we know about this crowd? I mean, what kind of people are in this crowd? Here's what we know, but we only know basically by what they say in verse 7. When they saw that Jesus said, I must eat at your house, he said, the crowd says, he has gone to be at the guest of a man who is a sinner. They began to grumble. They were upset. They were self-righteous, thought they deserved it, and Zacchaeus didn't. People that thought they were better than other people. They looked down on Zacchaeus, and look what they even said. You sinner, you don't deserve to be saved. You hear how self-righteous this is? Jesus should be coming to our house, not his. I'm worthy, you're not. And what does this mean for us? I mean, I think for most people today, in order to become a Christian, one of the things that they have a hard time putting away is their pride, thinking that they can save themselves. But one of the other things, and this is really sad for somebody who is a minister to have to say, but a lot of times what keeps other people from becoming Christians is Christians. Now, that sounds like a horrible thought, and I hate to even have to say that, but you know it's true. People can't get past the crowd. There's so many people in this world that profess to be Christians and use the word sinner to refer to the other group of people. 
They beat people up with it. They look down on others because of it. They ostracize others. There's so many people like this in the church today and throughout church history. So many people profess to be Christians and act self-righteous toward others that it's caused some people to just give up on Christianity. They can't get past the crowd. They can't get past what our churches start to look like today. They can't get past the fact that professing Christians will act one way on Sunday morning and a completely different way on Monday. They can't get past the fact that a lot of our churches here in America look no different than the world looks. Self-righteous, professing Christians who feel like they're better than others keep other people from wanting to know Christ. So what can they do? What hope do they have? Do what Zacchaeus did. He found a way to look at Jesus past the crowd. He found a vantage point where he could get over the top of the crowd and see Jesus directly. Here's what I would tell you. If you want to know who Jesus is, go look for Jesus. Sounds simple. Don't look to a sinner for it. I can try to help you, but don't, don't try to model it after me. Go look at who he is. Go read about him. Go talk to him. Go pray to him. Find out who he is directly. Because especially if you've been in church for a while, you know how some of these people are that have been in church before and they act a certain way. The people that show no love to others but confess to be Christians, that un act unchristian on every day but Sunday. They never share the gospel but still confess to be Christians. The people that when you come to church, instead of loving you and encouraging you, they simply judge you. The people who confess to be Christians but have forgotten that they are saved by grace through faith and not by our own efforts or works. The people who confess to be Christians but somehow think they are saved because they're better than you. If seeing those people has gotten in your way and keeping you from seeing who Jesus Christ really is, please, please, please let me say this. Don't let that stop you. Climb the tree and look directly at him. Find a vantage point away from the crowd. Look directly at his word. Speak directly to him. And when you do that, you'll find somebody who is infinitely better than any sinner here on earth. You'll find someone who actually is better than you, but has humbled himself to be with you. Someone who loves you no matter what you've done. Someone who doesn't expect you to clean yourself up perfectly because you can be with him, and he actually cleans you up perfectly. Someone who gave everything he had to be with you. What an amazing person. Get to know him. And as a side note, if you start reading about him, you're going to find out something kind of ironic. He didn't like those religious moral people either. It's pretty much on every single page. He didn't like them. Think about it. When he talked to all the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the sinners, how does he speak to them? Kindness, gentleness, and he wants a change. If you look at when Jesus Christ really got angry and started yelling at people, it was the super moral and religious people, the teachers, the Pharisees. In fact, it was the super moral people that put him to death. I mean, think about the Sermon on the Mount. What are the things that Jesus says? The religious leaders and the Bible teachers, they give to the poor like this, but you do this. The religious leaders and the Bible teachers, they pray like this, but you do this. The whole point of the Sermon on the Mount was don't do things like the religious leaders. Here's what I want you to do. And why is Jesus like that toward them? Because religious, religion says that I am good enough, God owes me. But the gospel says that God came to seek and save that which is lost. That we're saved by sheer grace. I love that word, sheer. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing else. Sheer grace. And it's usually the outsiders who are much faster to understand that than the insiders are. So don't let them get in the way of you seeking Jesus. Don't let some bad experiences with church people keep you from getting to know your Lord and Savior. And last, if you've climbed a tree, you've gotten over the crowd, take Jesus home. If you want the salvation of Jesus Christ to flow over your life, you've got to take Jesus home. When Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus, by the way, don't miss the irony of that, of somebody who is really, really short, and Jesus looks up to him. But when Jesus sees him and looks up to him, what does he say? Does he say, hey, believe in me and accept me? No, what Jesus says is, I'm coming home with you. In verse 5, Jesus says he wants to come to his house. And in verse 6, it says that Zacchaeus welcomed him. He received him gladly. Your version probably says with joy. He received him. 
And then in verse 7, it says that the crowd was mumbling. He's going to be a guest. Welcome. I want you to understand what those mean. Guest, welcome him. He's coming to his house. That means that it's room and board. This isn't just a quick meal like I thought when I was a little kid. It wasn't just like, hey, we got some finger foods or something. Come on over. Hang out with us. This is actually a stay. That means that Jesus came and lived with Zacchaeus for a short amount of time, probably stayed overnight, ate there. When Jesus says, I'm coming home with you, it's teaching us something. And it's the last thing that we need to see today. It shows us the order of grace. And I want you to see what the order says. Does Zacchaeus say, I'm going to stop cheating people, and then Jesus says, oh, okay, I'll go home with you. No, nah, that's not what happens. No, Jesus says, I'm coming home with you, and Zacchaeus hasn't even repented yet. Typically, we say Zacchaeus should have invited Jesus in, but you know what Jesus does? He invites himself into Zacchaeus' life. Jesus does not say, well, now, if you clean up your life, if you stop cheating people, then I'll come to live with you. Instead, he says, I'm coming to live with you. And Zacchaeus, in response, says, good, I'll stop cheating people. I mean, what's going on here? This is absolutely amazing. Jesus says, in spite of your sin, I want to be with you. He's not like the Wizard of Oz. Hey, go bring me the broom from the Wicked Witch, and then I'll talk to you. Oh, no. He doesn't do anything like that. He doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus says, in spite of your flaws, in spite of your record, in spite of your cheating, just on the knowledge that you might repent, I want to spend time with you. I'm giving you myself now. And in response of that, you can see here with Zacchaeus, is joy. He received him gladly. And you know what's so amazing about that? When Zacchaeus says, I'm going to stop cheating people, he says, behold, Lord. Look, Lord. A good translation of that, look, Dad. Look, Daddy. Do y'all remember, you know, some of you are still in this phase. I'm a little bit out of it at this point in time. But when you look, your little kids came in, they did this drawing. They were so proud of it. It was scribbles everywhere. You had no idea what it was. But it looked, you know, they went and they said, look, Daddy, look. And you go, oh, that's sweet. I mean, that's what he's saying here. He's like, look, Daddy, because of this grace, gratitude has shot through Zacchaeus like a lightning bolt. And Zacchaeus says, because you love me, I want to change. It's not I changed and now you love me. The love of Jesus Christ is not the basis for this change. The change is the result of Jesus' love. When Zacchaeus says he'll pay back half to the poor and give what he cheated, that is in response to what Jesus Christ has given to him. And the changes that Zacchaeus is going to do is a sign that salvation has come. He is saved by grace, and then change occurs in his heart. This tells us that grace will always really, really change you. The reason why these people are so upset that Jesus is willing to go eat with Zacchaeus Because in those days, to go home and eat with somebody really meant something important. It meant that you were going to participate in their life. In other words, they see Jesus as participating in the life of this sinner. I mean, that's what the whole point of the meal is, right? So now we can get together and participate in each other's lives. It's not just to eat food. Side bonus. It's not just to eat food. It is to participate in each other's lives. That's what Jesus is saying is, I want to be in your life. I mean, in those days, the evening meal was the center of family life. And you didn't do anything after dark. There was no electric lights. What did you do? You just turned on the torches, got all that stuff lit. You had a long, long meal, and then you went to sleep, which actually doesn't sound that bad. But you had a long meal, and then you went right to sleep afterwards. That's where they talked. That's where the family life came together. It was the heart of family life. And to invite someone into a meal like that not only was asking for intimacy, but to bring somebody into the heart of your family. Jesus says, if you want my salvation, don't just meet me on Sunday. I want to come into your very heart and all aspects of your life. I want every single nook and cranny of your life to be affected by my grace. And that's exactly what happens here. For example, the Bible says that you should give away 10% of your income to charity. You know what Zacchaeus says? I'm going to give 50. The Bible says that when you're paying back someone you've cheated, you give back the money plus 20%. That's in Numbers chapter 5. What does Zacchaeus say? I'll give back 400%. Zacchaeus is not just doing what's required. He's responding to grace. And he's doing it creatively. He's not trying to follow rules. He's just responding. You know why? (laughs) Why? Because he's rich. 
I mean, if you have to tithe, tithing for a poor or middle class person is actually a really big sacrifice. But let's be honest, for the rich, that's not that much of a sacrifice. So you know what? He just decides, I'm going to do 50%. Why? Because is there a rule about rich people tithing? No. The gospel has set him on a new adventure, and he's beginning to think about, how can I live this out? The gospel should change every part of your life. You aren't worrying about following a set of rules. You just want to live your life daily for Christ. And living that out can look a little different in all of us. But everything in your life, the way you spend your money, the jobs you take, the jobs you don't take, your Mondays, every aspect of your life should be affected by the gospel. How can Jesus look at us outsiders and say, I want to come eat with you? Because Jesus was an insider. I mean, he was in the Trinity. I don't think it gets more inside than that. He was in heaven. It doesn't get much more inside than that. He was in the bosom of the Father. I don't think it gets much more intimate than that. He was the ultimate insider, but he came to earth, was born in a manger, lived a perfect life. He came to seek and save the lost. He climbed the ultimate tree on the cross. He paid the ultimate price of losing dignity and pride and humbled himself on that tree. And there he became the ultimate outsider. He was separated from the Father. He died on the cross. He rose again three days later. He became the ultimate outsider so that you could become the ultimate insider. And now he can look at us, and no matter what we are and what we've done, and he can say to us, I want to come home with you. He comes to your home, so we have a chance to finally go home. That is a glorious homecoming. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for seeking us, for saving us. We could never have done this on our own, Lord, and yet here you are loving us for who we are. And in response to that, Lord, we should be pouring out blessings on others, on our gratitude on you, Lord, that we are thanking you each and every day for what you have done for us, that you have died on the cross for us, Lord, that you have lived the life we could never possibly hope to live. You died the death that we deserve to die. You defeated the evil one. You defeated death. You conquered it and rose again and then made us more than conquerors. We get to be a part of it, and we didn't even fight the battle, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you for what you have given to us, what you've done for us, for calling us home, that we have a chance to be with you, Lord. And so I just pray for each and every one of us. Let us welcome you in gladly. Let's not just take that invitation and do nothing with it. And just say thanks, but no thanks. Let us welcome you gladly. And when we do that, the grace that you have given us will change us completely. And so I just ask this for each and every one of us. Let us remember that each and every day. Let us live our life like we know it was you. It's always been you, and our life is getting ready to go see you. So I just pray for each and every one of us. Let us continue to seek. Now that you've come after us, let us continue to seek to know you better. Now that you saved us, we're not just content with that, Lord. We want to be with you at all times. And so I just ask for every single one of us in the room, let us be open to you and your word, and let us live it out for you, Lord. Let's glorify you in all that we do. Let us share that with others, Lord. Let's not keep this to ourselves. Let's spread your kingdom, Lord. Let others know what you have done for us and for them. Let us not look down on those sinners. Let's remember that we are sinners that you have sought and come and saved us, Lord. Amen.
so good to us today. We have met together in heavenly places. We have sung the songs of Zion and rejoiced in them. And we have fed upon your precious word from your servant. We thank you for his preparation and for him allowing the Holy Spirit to use him to speak to us of our deepest need. And so, Father, we, we pray that the the power of this message and the purpose of this message might continue to go on and on in the days to come. We ask you to bless the meal that we're going to have. We thank you for all the folks who have cooked and prepared and set up the fellowship hall and, and have spent uh, their energy and time being with us. We ask you to bless it and use it for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name. All the people said, Amen. Amen. 